All right, it's happy Halloween. This is 2016, and I'm going to just be honest with you. Talking about muscle physiology is making me a little bit nervous. I started on that end of the board over there, and then I eventually got over to this end, and then I went back to that end and over here, and so this lecture is all over the place. Anyhow, remember to study what your teacher wants you to master for your class. This is, is a specific review for a specific class at my school. Anyhow, you're welcome to be here. I'm glad you're here. So let's get started. One of the things that happens in a muscle is that normally a muscle is at a resting potential of negative 85 millivolts. And what happens is when the ligand gated channels are opened by acetylcholine, it allows sodium to flow inward, thus making the membrane less negative, more electropositive. To reestablish this membrane potential, there's a sodium potassium ATPase pump that pumps the potassium, ion, potassium ions out, not sodium ions, other positive ions to reestablish the membrane potential so that another contraction can occur. In an action potential, as sodium moves into the membrane and depolarizes the cell, uh, we have this spike moving upward. And as the membrane is reset back down to its original resting potential, that is called repolarization. So this side of the spike is called depolarization. This side is called repolarization. Remember that when we have a contraction, we go from negative 85 millivolt potential to plus 30 millivolts. Notice that sodium influx causes that positive change in the membrane, and then it's potassium out that resets the membrane for another muscle contraction. Now, when we look back over to this other diagram, we can see that it's a pump called the sodium potassium ATPase pump that typically maintains a concentration of sodium and potassium across the membrane. So come over here with me for just a minute and let's look at this neuromuscular junction that I have drawn here. I have drawn an axon with a synaptic knob right here. This is the postsynaptic <coughs> membrane. There's a presynaptic membrane and when this electrical potential reaches the end of this knob, it causes vesicles to exocytose these acetylcholine molecules, these green ones, which interact with a protein in the postsynaptic membrane, thus unlocking the channel so that sodium can go into the, uh, the muscle fiber area. That is what caused that, that rapid spike and that depolarization from negative 85 millivolts to plus 30 millivolts. Now, interestingly enough, as this happens, this is what leads to muscle contraction. And so calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is just infoldings of the sarcolemma into the muscle fiber. It creates a, a, tri a triad called a T-tubule and terminal cisternae. As the calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it binds to troponin. Troponin is in this little thin actin filament up here, and it causes something called tropomyosin to be moved. And what happens is these little tiny heads on the myosin strand reach up and grab onto the actin uh, with the help of ATP. And then uh, next, the power stroke, which is the main feature of a muscle contraction, bringing the muscle together, occurs as the ADP and the phosphate are released from this little myosin head. When a muscle contracts, it gets shorter. Remember, when muscles contract, they get shorter. Muscles don't get longer by contracting. Now, before we leave this picture right here, let's look at some of the anatomy and I may go back and review in just a moment. The I band in a muscle is the area where we have actin and the elastic fibers called titan. <clears throat> Apparently titan extends through the entire length of the myosin in the middle. It's just hidden by the thick filament myosin, which you see in the, in the middle. The A band is the middle band that has actin and myosin in, in the center. 
there is an M line to which the myosin is connected. And notice that whenever the actin fibers get pulled toward the center, it diminishes the H zone. The H zone, in effect, shrinks. So when we look at a graph showing muscle contraction, let's look at this graph right here just for a moment. This is tension versus time, 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. As these cross bridges bring all of this together, then we have the maximum muscle tension, and then the tension in the muscle decreases as calcium is pumped back into the smooth, uh, I'm sorry, I want to say smooth endoplasmic reticulum, it is a sarcoplasmic reticulum, thank you. In a myogram, before the actual full muscle contraction occurs where calcium spreads th from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the muscle to unlock the muscle for contraction, there is a brief latent period right down here, a one to two millisecond period of time when the potential moves through the sarcolemma to prepare for calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember, thick filaments are myosin, thin filaments are actin. So I want you to come back over to this side of the board with me and let's begin in the beginning. That is a very good place to start even though we didn't really start in the beginning. This whole unit is on muscle tissue and physiology. The sarcolemma is the outer layer around the muscle cell. It is a phospholipid bilayer, just like in a regular cell. The inward extensions are the T-tubules. Remember, when we have a T-tubule with two terminal cisternae, that's called a triad. The sarcoplasm is the liquid portion. When I read about the definition of cytoplasm and sarcoplasm, I used to understand that cytoplasm just indicates or talks about the liquid inside of the cell. But in fact, the definitions that I'm seeing on cytoplasm is that it is the liquid in all the other components except for the nucleus inside of the cell. So look this up maybe a little bit more in detail, but sarcoplasm, at least it's a liquid inside of the cell, if not everything ex except the nuclei inside of the muscle cells. Remember that skeletal muscle is striated. Why is it striated? Because it has actin and myosin overlapping. <clears throat> Remember that the sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, is what releases calcium. I can pay close attention to this. Why is this important? Because calcium binds to troponin and it removes tropomyosin, which is like, it looks like a little wire or something to me that's, that's covering the sites, the active sites on the actin. It allows the myosin head to bind to actin. And come over close slowly with me one more minute. When, it, when I'm talking about the myosin head binding, I'm talking about this situation right here. Instead of being in this state, it has reached up and it has contacted with the active sites. These pop back down. That's the power stroke. That's what brings everything together. How did they even get in this position? Because of ATP, remember that. How did the power stroke occur? Because ADP and phosphate were released from this myosin head. A clarification, the calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum is what binds to troponin and causes the tropomyosin to be moved. It looks like a little wire that actually covers up the sites on this actin. It is what makes the myosin head have a place to fit, but it's actually the ATP release that causes the myosin to reach up and grab a hold of the actin, and then eventually it's the release of ADP and phosphate from the headpiece that causes the power stroke, and then eventually this whole situation relaxes and we can go back and be ready for another muscle contraction. This piece right here, I actually, it says relaxation, relaxation occurs afterward. Eventually these heads will pop back down. This is before, this is after, and then this, what I drew here is actually should be down here in sequence. I just ran out of room. I drew it all together. So come back over here with me for a minute and let's look at a few more things <clears throat> as we get ready to wrap this up. When we think about skeletal muscle being striated, there is also smooth muscle, which is not striated. 
And what, what we are learning is that there are pacemaker cells in smooth muscle. We're talking about stuff in your guts that move, moves food through your intestines. Do they use calcium for the muscle contraction? Yes, but uh, there is no troponin in smooth muscle. Instead, there is a protein called calmodulin that results in muscle contraction of a smooth muscle. Another interesting feature of smooth muscle is peristalsis. In a smooth muscle, there is a longitudinal muscle layer that goes the length of the muscle and contracts this way. And then there is a circular layer around the lumen or the submucosa that contracts this way, like this. And so apparently it is the alternating contraction of the longitudinal fibers this way and the contraction of the circular fibers that results in the peristaltic smooth muscle contraction which moves food through your intestine without you thinking about it. Remember that in the mus muscle system, uh, the skeletal muscle system, in a motor unit, uh, we say that that is a motor neuron with all the muscle, muscle fibers it innervates. Typically there are about 150 muscle fibers associated with every neuron. If uh, we're talking about the hand, which is very fine motor control, there might be 10 muscle uh, fibers associated with one motor neuron. In the calf muscle, which allows for uh, plantar flexion of the foot, there might be 3,000 fibers associated with one motor neuron there. So in a motor unit contraction, what if you did not enlist enough firepower? Your body can also recruit in other motor units. This is called recruitment. And initially, slow motor units are called into action first, then fast motor units are called into action as needed. If a muscle <clears throat> is hypotonic or hypertonic, hypotonia is not enough muscle tone, hypertonic is too much. A lot of times these are associated with nerve system disorders. And atrophy is a little bit different. That is usually something that would result from disuse as compared to a nerve system disorder. Of course, you and I have seen these people who are contortionists and there's also maybe some ligament laxity around joints and things like that. That's kind of another thing that's really not discussed much, but uh, is worthy of note. Kind of interesting to, to see that at times. Muscle types, type one and type two. Type one muscle is an endurance muscle. It is called slow oxidative, and it's gonna have more myoglobin. Type two muscles have less myoglobin. These are considered <coughs> like white meat when you eat a chicken. This would be the, the lighter meat. These are also called fast oxidative glycolytic muscle fibers. These are muscles that fire in bursts. <coughs> This does not match right here. When our bodies want quick energy, quick cheap energy, anaerobic glycolytic oxidation can happen. If there's not enough oxygen, then it results in a lactic acid buildup, maybe a couple of ATP. This may be what makes a person sore after a hard workout. There's kind of some debate on this. Some people say that it's because of destruction of muscle fiber. <laughs> Some people say it's lactic acid buildup. I, I think it's probably a little bit of both. I do think that. Aerobic respiration and when ox, and where, where oxygen is the final electron acceptor in mitochondria results in 36 to 38 ATP. I have heard of different people say that no cell busts out 36 to 38 ATP, that this is a very optimistic uh, estimation. But I suppose we have to have some systems to try to think about how these things work and where the energy comes from and how much we get out of it so that we can take tests. That's why. Remember that myoglobin is the oxygen binding protein in muscle. I hope I spelled protein correctly. I before E except after C. I don't know. Is this right? Protein. P-R-O-T-E-I-N. Everybody's laughing. It's probably wrong. Anyhow. Uh, okay, let's talk about... Let's talk about tendons connecting muscles to bones. There's an epimysium that surrounds the entire muscle. Perimysium surrounds fascicles. Endomysium surrounds the sarcolemma. So this is kind of going from big to little here in this picture right here. One of the things that we have that we talk about is a practical 
situation, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is an X-linked syndrome caused by a defective gene uh, for dystrophin. I did a little Punnett square right here to kind of show you how this would work. This female is a carrier, little d. She's X D, X big D, X little d. She is reproductive partners with a normal male, uh, X big D, Y. Here are all the possibilities that could happen with the offspring. If this X crossed with this one, you'd have X big D, X big D, which is actually a normal female, not even a carrier. We can have X D little d, which would be a carrier what? Carrier female. What if we had XD with Y? This would be what? A normal what? A normal male. Remember, if, the, if he has a Y chromosome, if he, they're, they're male, as far as we know, genetically anyway, at least. X little d, Y, what would this, this little square result in? It, it, you want to say it's a carrier male, but remember, males only have one X, so whatever program they get, they have to run the program. So if a man gets an X little d, what does he have in this case? He has the problem, which is called what? What is the problem we're talking about? It's muscular dystrophy, right? Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Yes. So that is a generic breakdown of muscle physiology. Not bad. Whoops. Let's look at this little picture right here. Come up close and let's look at this one more time and just so that I can make sure I broke this down like I wanted to. Remember, as sodium goes into that postsynaptic membrane, it results in calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is what binds to troponin, moves the tropomyosin. This is what allows these little myosin heads to reach up and grab a hold of the actin. What makes this happen? ATP is what allows these to reach up and grab. And then remember, as the ADP and P releases, listen to me, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. If you take a phosphate off, it is now ADP, adenosine diphosphate. Okay, that's where we get those words. So as those peel off of these little mice and heads, this is what caused that snapping power stroke. This is what causes the muscle to contract. One of the main features that I, I say is the H zone shrinks whenever a muscle contracts. The muscle shortens as it contracts. One more thing I did leave out just a minute ago. <clears throat> when we look at how a muscle, muscle tension develops, if we have summative muscle contractions, it can lead to a situation called tetanus, which is not a good situation. We would kind of consider that to be a pathological situation. So anyhow, happy Halloween, uh, October 2016, and uh, study hard. Grandma Barnes says A plus 100. Everybody make an A plus 100. Be safe. Be smart. Keep coming back. <laughs>